What companies deserve your hard-earned dollar? Which would you want to work for? How can you know if they share your values? Just ask us. Just Capital is a nonprofit that tracks who really means business in supporting workers, customers, communities, the environment, and shareholders. We measure progress, track success, and help them be better. When you see the Just Capital seal, you know what's real because just business is better business. Visit justcapital.com to learn who makes your dollar count. Good afternoon. We are doing it live right here on 790 KBC, Motec on Money. Weekday afternoons at 4, live on the air on 790 KBC, streaming live online worldwide at kbc.com and the on-demand Motec on Money podcast at kbc.com, Apple, iTunes, and all your favorite podcast platforms. A lot to talk about today. We did see a mixed finish on Wall Street as investors took in the Latest uh, reports and also gains from the previous session that hit the S&P 500 to a 17th record high of the year. We did come off uh, that record high only slightly today. The Dow coming in for a closing gain of 38 points. It's a shy of its all-time high. The S&P 500 ended lower by just about 10 points, and the Nasdaq finished down by just about 88 points. We have seen a record rally recently, not only for stocks, but also for uh, cryptos with Bitcoin. Hitting record highs again today. Did you see that? Looks like uh, Bitcoin popped above 73000 for the first time. We did see shares of Dollar Tree pulling back 14% after the discount retailer missed its fourth quarter profit expectations. Petco stock, ticker symbol on this one. We'll get a chuckle out of this one. Is Wolf, W-O-O-F, down about 2%. Uh, finishing lower today, the operator of pet care centers and Veterinary Clinics posted another quarterly loss. Shares of Tesla sliding again today, about down about 4.5%. This after Wells Fargo downgraded that EV maker to the equivalent of sell from whole and lowered its price target from 125 a share to 200 a drop of almost 38% from 200 Take a look at uh, what's happening with uh, Fisker. This is big news here. Shares of Fisker dropping more than 40%. In an extended session this afternoon on a report that the embattled EV maker is exploring a bankruptcy filing. The Wall Street Journal reports that Fisker has hired restructuring advisors to assist with the possible filing, according to the Wall Street Journal, citing people familiar with what's happening there at Fisker. The EV maker, uh, the journal notes, lost about $464 million, or $1.23 a share in the quarter, compared with a loss of $0.34 cents a share in the fourth quarter of 2023. The founder of Fisker Automotive, Danish designer Henrik Fisker, has resigned from the company's uh, mid-board infighting just before a bankruptcy back in 2013, but he retained some brand rights and went on to found and lead Fisker. Shares of Fisker, by the way, down about 95% in the past 12 months, which contrasts with gains of about 34% for the S&P 500. Well, let's get right to uh, the big news here. We are, of course, also watching what's happening uh, on the economy and inflation. Inflation still running hot. Uh, we'll talk. We'll get right down to business later this hour with David Zappos, the chairman of the uh, board of the Council for Innovation Promotion, chairman of the board there. And also, uh, crime is still a big issue for businesses in Los Angeles, of course. I'll talk about that with the Honorable Dennis Zine, former L.A. City Council member and former LAPD sergeant and current reserve police officer, Dennis Zine, on the line with us later this hour. But right now, let's get to the latest on the markets, your money, the markets and the economy. Investment expert Jonathan Honig joining us live now, Fox News contributor, portfolio manager at Capitalist Pig Hedge Fund and the author of the book, Price is Primary, How to Profit with Any Asset in Any Market at Any Time. Jonathan, great to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you, Frank. Great to be with you and <laughs> lots to talk about. As you said, I mean, look, crypto's hot, gold is hot, stocks are hot, plenty of places to make money and even a couple places to lose, lose money in this market. Right. Well, let's talk about all of that. And P.S. Bitcoin at record highs. Uh, again, we talked to the biggest fans of Bitcoin as well as the harshest critics, but it's hard to ignore uh, that move uh, that we've seen again today. No, Bitcoin at an all time high. And, you know, Frank, I, I, I'm not a, a, an owner of Bitcoin, but you can't be a hater of it. I mean, this is a bull market and I can't explain it as we've talked about it in the past. Only 2% of people who own crypto actually use it as a currency. My belief is that what we're really looking at is people looking for alternate stores of value. I mean, the fact that 
Bitcoin is at an all-time high and gold is at an all-time high. Uh, makes me believe, Frank, that we're really starting to see that store of value uh, theme for Bitcoin. And in fact, although I don't own Bitcoin right now, I do think you can own gold, GLD, and other commodities right now. I think we're really looking at a, a period of time where you're going to start to see the dollar fall and gold and other commodities rise along with Bitcoin as people search for another store of value in today's economy. And speaking of the economy, uh, why don't you take in the latest reports uh, we got uh, on jobs uh, last Friday and the consumer uh, price index that came out this week. Uh, looks like uh, suddenly unemployment at a two-year high and inflation still running hot. Uh, give us your assessment of things here at the moment. Well, look, I mean, uh, my belief, Frank, is that we're really entering a period that's not unlike the second half of the 1970s. You know, when we think of the 1970s, all the economic turmoil we think of really the we're really thinking of the second half of the 1970s. That was a period where the dollar fall, fell, interest rates rose, gold rose, and I really think we're starting to see that right now once again. As you said, uh, it's the CPI running hot, inflation running hot, and uh, interest rates starting to pick up once again. Maybe not at the fervor that they were a year or two years ago, but we're starting to see rates rise once again. And you know that's my belief, Frank. In fact, a lot of people calling for the Fed to cut rates. My sense is that in the next year, two years, they're going to see rates significantly higher than they are right now. So, you know, my fear is that inflation is continuing to run hot. That's why you're seeing gold at an all-time high. You're seeing the dollar fall. And, and uh, my, my fear is that we're, we're, you know, in store for even higher inflation in the weeks and months to come. All right, let's talk about what's happening in the EV world um, with Tesla under pressure. And then uh, that report from the Wall Street Journal that, that Fisker might uh, be uh, filing for bankruptcy. This is big news here. We're looking at Fisker's stock down about 40% in after-hours trading. Give us your reaction to what's happening uh, in EV world here. Well, there was a time, Frank, when, you know, te Tesla was really the only, maybe in Tesla and Fisker were the only names when it came to EVs. That's changed a lot in just the last couple of years. And, you know, of course, every major met Every major manufacturer now is is the heavy into EVs and and just simply not the the kind of the the place the the popular trade in the market that it once was. As you mentioned, Fisker uh, going bankrupt and even Tesla down 31 percent year to date. So you know there was a time when anything related to EVs was gold in the stock market. It's just simply reversed. That trend is over, and uh, you know you're you're going to continue to see this. I think simply the fact that you know, just the same way that, uh, you know, EVs are commonplace now, the buzz is off. And I think this is a place they're going to want to avoid when it comes to putting money to work. And, of course, the government have been pushing uh, electric power uh, despite the uh, concerns about the power grid, and especially here in California with the way things are going. And, and uh, now uh, we're seeing also demand appears to be uh, waning. Uh, as people uh, weigh the, the costs involved of um, electric power and, and the infrastructure and all that. So um, what do you see ahead here? Obviously, there have been some big winners and big losers. Yeah, that's really frustrating, Frank. I mean, the, the real uh, uh, fervor for EVs has not been a market phenomena. As you said, this has been something that has primarily been pushed by government, all the incentives and the, you know, the demands, etc. It's really been a a political edict, much more than a market-based edict. A lot of consumers report they don't like the the hassles, if you will, of the EV ownership. So you're going to really start to see a shakeout here. I mean, the, the stocks are basically forecasting that, Frank. As I said, I mean, Tesla, which had been the real leader, it's coming near a, a resistance going back to basically 2023. Stock is down pretty sharply year to date. So we're seeing a shakeout here. And you know, this always happens when, in my opinion, when government gets involved in business, you see tremendous amount of malinvestment, and it's going to be a really dangerous time, I think, to own Tesla stock or anything related in EVs, as exactly as you said, Frank, a real shakeout uh, in just the usability of these vehicles moving forward. Of course, Tesla among the Magnificent Seven, so-called, and looks like uh, not as magnificent uh, as they were certainly in the last year or so. Uh, and now we have, we're down to the Magnificent One now, NVIDIA, which uh, has been hitting record highs lately. Uh, what about uh, the other Mag 7 and the Magnificent One here? Well, this is just a changing of the guard, and it's actually healthy, Frank. I mean, for well over a year now, we talked about the, the dominance of the market and those 
you know, rare seven stocks. The good news is that it's broadened now. I mean, we mentioned a lot of the commodity-related names doing well. Emerging markets are doing well. You're starting to see oil perk up once, uh, peak up once again. I'm looking at an ETF, AMLP, that owns a bunch of uh, em- uh, energy-related master limited partnerships. Great dividend on that one on AMLP. So uh, the Magnificent Seven, Frank, great companies. But this is a trend that basically, in my opinion, is over in the stock market. As you said, we're starting to see international stocks uh, outperform uh, domestic names. So I think there's money to be made in this market, but I just don't think it's going to be in those uh, AMD and uh, the high-tech names that really have led the market for quite some time. Uh, Apple, wonderful company. NVIDIA, wonderful company. Uh, Meta, wonderful company. But these stocks are overpriced and simply not where the market is looking right now. All right, so you would avoid uh, the Mag 7 right now? Yeah, indeed, Frank. I mean, again, terrific companies, but I'm looking at names, for example, like CUT, C-U-T. That's another ETF that owns timber-related stocks. Or P-S-C-E, that's an ETF that owns small-cap energy-related. Now, they're not sexy, and certainly the the Mag 7, those uh, technology names are uh, tremendously uh, sexy and and eye-popping returns in recent years. But I think we're seeing a changing of the guard. Gold is telling us that. Bitcoin is telling us that, in fact. And uh, there's going to be new places to make money besides those very high-flying tech stocks. They've been the leaders for quite some time, but they're not going to be the leaders moving forward. All right. You mentioned uh, you're uh, not too fond of um, the blockchain, but but gold chain, yes, right? And, And any other of the metals that are getting new attention now? Yeah, I mean, the, the old saying is a rising tide lifts all boats. You know that, Frank. And just the same yes, way sir. that, you know, when, when the semiconduct, semiconductors are flying, all the semiconductor stocks, by and large, are flying. So, indeed, I think you can own gold, GLD. I also like platinum. That's PPLT. And this one, Frank, is, you know, really at a fraction, less than about half of where it was trading just even eight or ten years ago. So, a lot of these uh, commodity names have room to run. I like platinum, as I said. And you know, more than anything, I think you want to have some, some cash on the sidelines, Frank. As we said, we're seeing a changing of the guard, so you don't want to be fully invested. You want to have plenty of uh, dry powder, if you will, taking advantage of some of the new trends emerging. But platinum, uh, PPLT, definitely off the radar screen, one to include in your portfolio. And we do own this one at Capitalist Peg as well. All right. It's just kind of uh, human nature when uh, things start hitting record highs. That's when it seems everybody uh, piles in. But one thing we haven't heard too much about lately is silver, which has been quietly uh, moving higher uh, around, uh, what, $24 an ounce or so. What about silver here? Same thing. I mean, that, as we said, a rising tide and, you know, just as, uh, you know, a, a rising tide in technology benefited nearly all of those names. I do think you're going to see the same thing when it comes to commodities, Frank. I mean, the, the, the easy way to play it, if you will, is BBC. That is a, an ETF that owns just a broad range of commodities. But silver, I, I agree with you, SLV, breaking out new multi-month highs, uh, extraordinarily strong on the, on the tr- charts. And if the inflation story heats up, and as I said, uh, go back to the 1970s, the inflation story really was a second half of that decade. If we're following that trend now, I think you're going to see silver prices significantly higher, and SLV is one you can own at these levels. On the air live with Jonathan Honig, Fox News contributor and portfolio manager at Capitalist Pig Hedge Fund, live with us here on Motec on Money on 790 KABC. And, of course, uh, coming off the uh, the president's State of the Union speech uh, and reaction, and, of course, uh, it is a presidential election year. Um, how, how's the market taking uh, in this uh rematch uh, we're about to see what's so interesting frank is that the market you know people always say well what is the shutdown shutdown going to do for the market and what is the election going to do for the market more often than not if you look at the history and you look at the statistics the market tends to have a minds of it of, of its own shutdowns in fact tend to have not a big impact on the market and, uh, and, and when it comes to uh, uh, uh elections it's much more the policies even even than the, uh, the party that wins. Uh, you know, there's not even a, demonstra- a demonstrable uh, indicator, Frank, for example, if Democrats versus Republicans win, it's all about the policies that they, they enact. So certainly we're keeping an eye on taxes, we're keeping an eye on regulation, both of those uh, major issues facing American corporations right now. And at this point, I mean, look, the trend is your friend when it comes to stocks. 
but lots of uncertainty in the election year, as you said. President Trump, among other things, is is uh, 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 proposing dramatic impact, uh, excuse me, dramatic tariffs on imports from China. So lots of uncertainty, Frank, and that's why I think you want to have plenty of dry powder uh, in the till coming up on the, in the election to come. We're going to have plenty of volatility, not only with just inflation, but the, with the election as well. So it's a good time to have that powder in the can. Right. And then, of course, the Fed also in the mix. And uh, we're going to be getting the inflation reading uh, at the wholesale level this week as well. And that'll be the Fed's uh, last look at inflation before a, a rate decision. What do you think is going to happen this time around? And, and what is the outlook on on uh, Fed benchmark uh, interest rates? Uh, will, will they be standing um, pat or will they finally be lowering? you got to look for the long term, but rates are actually up this year. I mean, all this talk, Frank, about uh, Oh, the Fed's going to be lowering rates. The Fed's going to be lowering rates. Yeah. As you said, I mean, the interest rates have actually been heading up. So, you know, my fear is that just as the CPI was running hot, you're likely to see other indicators of inflation continue to run hot. And again, if that second half of the 1970s is any indication, Gerald Ford thought they had inflation beat. You know, interest rates have come down from about 9% to 7% by 1977. Four years later, interest rates had more than doubled. So I'm not a Cassandra Frank, but I simply don't think that the government has stopped spending. That would that would uh, suggest that inflation has been whipped. So my sense is that we're going to see a hot uh, producer price index and, in fact, higher interest rates in the months to come. On your live with Jonathan Honig, uh, any other specific places, uh, Jonathan Honig, where you are putting money now and or taking it off the table? Sure. Well, we talked a little bit about some of the off the radar screen ideas like cut. And I'll give you one more, Frank. It's actually it's, it sounds a, a bit out there, but it's China. You know, I mean, uh, Chinese stocks we know have been decimated. They're trading uh, extraordinarily low multiples. They're the cheapest relative to their profits anywhere in the developed world. So ECNS, that's ECNS, owns Chinese small cap companies. Again, not something you're going to find in most portfolios, but this, now is the time to truly diversify. And I think emerging markets, including China, are going to be a place you're going to make money in the weeks to come. Terrific, Jonathan. Thank you very much for uh, taking the call this afternoon. That is Jonathan Honig, Fox News contributor, portfolio manager at Capitalist Big Hedge Fund, an author of the great book Price is Primary, How to Profit with Any Asset in Any Market at Any Time. Jonathan, wish you a great evening, and thank you very much uh, for joining us live here this afternoon. Best to you, Frank. Be well. Thank you very much. And right out to the freeways we go now, live from 790 KBC. Friends, people like you and me over ear to the ground in all things business. We like to be informed and indeed well prepared. As important as finance is, I want you to have a plan in case you're hit by someone not paying attention to the road. Thinking ahead serves as well. And even still, we can get caught off guard as people are so focused on their destinations that they might not have a plan if they're in an accident that is not their fault. That's why I encourage you to put my friend, Attorney Clark Fielding's number, in your phone. That number is 833-88-SHARK. So if you're in an accident, you'll be ready with your strategy to make Clark Fielding your very first call. Fielding Law aims for the highest possible settlements, considering you might need long-term care, rehab, compensation for lost wages, and any ongoing physical or emotional pain. So if you're hurt in any kind of accident, call for a free consultation with Fielding Law. You can trust them. They're honest, respected, and your strategy in case you get into that unexpected accident. Motorcycle, truck, pedestrian, scooter, hit and run, boating, or bike accidents, you name it. The number to call, 833-88-SHARK. That's 833-88-SHARK. Or go to ClarkTheSharkLaw.com. Motaco Money continues here in 790 KBC. Mixed finish on Wall Street today with the Dow up 38 points, 39,043 at the close, near its record high. The S&P 500 pulling back from its record high, down 10 points at 5,165. The Nasdaq down 88 at 16,178. All the major averages hovering near record highs. The price of gold, which hit a record high in the last couple of days, pulling back a couple of dollars now at 2,179 an ounce. Crude oil. Near its high point of the year, just shy of eighty dollars a barrel, down thirteen cents at seventy nine fifty nine. We saw in that latest report on consumer prices that energy costs are up two point three percent recently, and that has put the consumer price index up point four percent for last month and up three point two percent compared to a year ago. Still running hot and coming in hotter than expected. 
This at a time when the national unemployment rate has ticked higher as well at a two-year high based on that report we got from the Labor Department last Friday. We'll get another reading on inflation at the wholesale level this week, and the Fed will take a look at that and then come out with their decision on interest rates and a statement on the economy coming up here pretty soon. Meanwhile, Bitcoin at a record high, about 73,000 now. Yep, you heard me, pulling back about 400 now. It's 73,022. Ethereum down six. It's been on a tear, moving above 4,000 recently, right now at 3,986. And Doge at 17 cents. Recapping this uh, Wall Street Journal article that we referenced earlier, shares of Fisker, the EV maker, dropping more than 40% this afternoon on a report in the Wall Street Journal that said the embattled EV maker is exploring a bankruptcy filing. The Wall Street Journal reporting that Fisker has hired restructuring advisors to assist with a possible filing, citing people familiar with the matter talking to the Wall Street Journal. A couple of weeks ago, the journal notes Fisker warned it risk running out of cash and that it was in talks with an unnamed major car maker for an investment or a joint development of one or more electric vehicle platforms. And now the latest news here on 790 KBC. Motec of Money continues here, 790 KBC. Good afternoon. We're doing it live in the 4 o'clock hour here, live on the air on 790 KBC, streaming live online worldwide, kbc.com, and yes, the on-demand Motec of Money podcast at kbc.com, Apple iTunes, and all your favorite podcast platforms. Crime still a big issue for businesses in the Los Angeles area. Another heartbreaking story here, a beauty store owner, is fighting for her life at the hospital after she was brutally attacked by a group of suspected robbers in the city of Commerce. According to Fox 11, 32-year-old Marlene Sandoval tried to stop a group of suspects from robbing the M Beauty store on Whittier Boulevard this month. The group of women targeting Sandoval's business began viciously attacking her, pulling her hair, and then throwing her to the ground. The attack happened as Marlene Sandoval tried to stop her business from being looted. Now, Marlene Sandoval is in an ICU, is in desperate need of a heart transplant. One horrifying story after another. Let's bring in the Honorable Dennis Zein, former L.A. City Council member and former LAPD sergeant, current LAPD reserve officer. Dennis Zein is on the line. Dennis, thank you very much for taking the call here. Your reaction to these latest reports. Frank, continuing horrifying stories about the crime that's taking place within Los Angeles County, 88 cities, nothing but crime and violence continues. And as the vote count continues, we find if Gascon's going to remain or go, we know that there's a direct correlation between who's in elective office and crime trends. For example, Los Angeles, as of February 10th, LA has now shrunk to 8,876 officers. 8876 and every time we look at it the numbers shrink as far as murders as of the 2nd of march murders are up in los angeles city 16.3 percent robberies are up 13.8 percent burglaries are up 4.3 percent grand theft auto is up 9.6 percent and shootings are up so as we see the crime trend continue to increase and the number of law enforcement personnel continue to decrease, the public is in jeopardy. And the tragedy that happened to this lady who tries to protect her property, her business, she's now in critical condition in a hospital because of the assault that followed the robbery. This is a continuing story that doesn't seem to change. And if we don't change the people who are in charge of safety, in charge of the political structure, we're gonna continue these trends which is very, very sad and depressing. Certainly, and it is to be noted, uh, just before the uh, the primary election last week, um, we did get the report that shoplifting is up 81% uh, in Los Angeles, uh, just to add, uh, add that to the tally. Well, there's no consequence for criminal activity, and that's the problem. As long as we have people like Gascon, and if he does get elected, uh, re-elected, we're going to find the same trend and it'll get worse because people know there's no consequence. Whatever I do, it's okay. I'll get away with it. I'll get a slap on the wrist if I get that. And there's not enough police to really do a lot of work that they need to do. You see the patrols diminishing. You see the rank and file diminishing. You see the lack of initiative because they're concerned about their careers and getting in trouble and getting terminated. So there's a lot of factors that lead into this. It wasn't always this way. But I'm telling people that if Gascon somehow manages to get reelected, 
and Nithya Raman and some of the people who were against public safety, it's time to say, you know what, I need to leave Los Angeles County. I don't know if you can leave California, but surely you need to look at outside of Los Angeles County because this will just get worse in the next four years. These people who have direct control of our safety are in elective office, people elect them, and we've done a lot to try and inform the people, educate the people, encourage the people. Some of them listen, and obviously a lot of them didn't listen, and they're putting people in place. That creates this environment of more and more crime and less and less safety for the women, the men, the children, the students. It just continues. It's a song that doesn't end. Must be heartbreaking for you to say that, uh, having dedicated 56 years of service to the City of Angels uh, on the City Council, as well as uh, on the front line uh, as an LAPD officer. Now, given the choice uh, coming up here, uh, Nathan Hockman, the veteran prosecutor, will be facing the the incumbent. Uh, certainly a big difference in uh, approach uh, and experience there, right? Absolutely. Uh, I know both of them. I know Nathan, and I know our current district attorney. I know them both, and uh, we need a change. And if the vote shows that uh, the change takes place, we will improve. But if it shows it doesn't take place, just as we see Nithya Raman is now in the lead, uh, that's a very, very sad situation for public safety. I don't want to alarm people. I just want to give them the truth. The truth of the matter is you've got people in public office that establish your quality of life and the safety for you and your family. And if they don't do what they're supposed to do to support public safety, we're going to have this continuing saga of more crime, more violence, and more people that are saying, who's going to come to our rescue? Where's that individual going to make our city safe, our environment safe? Well, it's you, the voters, that make that choice. And I keep on pounding on the voters because it's up to them to make sure the choice is to make it safe for them, their families, their property, etc. So this saga will only end when we get people in place that can establish safety and security for everyone and their families and their property. Until that point, we're going to continue with this, and more people will say, I'm going to leave Los Angeles. You'll go to another county, but you're not going to stay in L.A. County. And that number you gave us, uh, the force uh, size of the LAPD, isn't that lower than when Mayor Reardon w- was in office? Well, I think we were around 10,000 or close to 10,000. Uh, 8876, I mean, when you think of 8876, and I emphasize, this is everyone from the chief. We have an interim chief at this particular time. Where did the chief of police go? Where did our departing chief of police go? He went to Tennessee. He's leaving Los Angeles. What does that tell you? A man who spent 40 years with the Los Angeles Police Department, he's moving to Tennessee. Why? Because he knows it's safer in Tennessee than it is in Los Angeles. The quality of life is better and the cost of living is is better. So what we have is 8876. That's everyone from the chief of police to the recruit in the academy. And if we get 20 or 25 who graduate, that's not a lot of people because you get 50 and 60 retiring. The retiring continues. People don't stay here until they die. They stay here for 20, 25, maybe 30. I'm still active at 55 years of service. And people say, why are you staying? Why don't you get out? Well, I'm, I'm, I've got that glimmer of hope. I've got the glimmer of hope that maybe it'll get better. But believe me, when I see these elections and it turns out sideways, we've got some serious situations to consider. And everybody calls me and they say, where can I get a CCW? When can I get a CCW? Can I get a CCW? Yes, you can get a CCW. I encourage you to get it. Well, I don't like guns. Well, you know what? Do you like your safety? Do you like to protect your family? Maybe you should think about that. On the live with uh, we're on the line with Dennis Zine, uh, and let me ask you this, uh, Dennis Zine: uh, We see uh, buildings uh, being taken over, intersections being taken over, stores uh, being taken over. Uh, of course, a lot of this caught on on video and all that. Um, what what about the response time for the police, and and, and what does it take to, to get a response uh, out there at the moment? Uh, and even though you have something caught uh, on video, uh, what are the chances these people are, are being uh, picked up? Oh, well, Frank, you bring something up. There's a local businessman in the uh, West San Fernando Valley who called me. He said, uh, my business was broken into. Uh, by the time I got there, the suspects were gone. He called the police. The police were alerted by the alarm company. It took the unit 45 minutes to get there, 45 minutes to get to the site. Uh, then he gets a bill from the city of Los Angeles. And they want a fine because they said it was a false alarm. Well, they didn't steal anything because the alarm scared the people off. But they want to find this individual, this businessman. They want to find him because they didn't take anything. This is absurd. So I went to the police commission executive director and said, look into this. He said, yeah, you're right. It took except except amount of time to get to the location. Uh, the suspects, the alarm goes off, the suspects flee. So nothing was taken. Now they want to find this man. 
because they didn't steal any property. I mean, sometimes I look at the system that is absolutely absurd, absolutely absurd. So hopefully we'll be able to have his fine waived. Uh, and he's just another victim. And his business has been broken into a number of times. And he pays for an alarm. And he does his permit. He does everything proper. And this is the safety. And then when the alarm goes off, it takes that length of time for the unit to arrive, the black and white unit to arrive to check the place out. We're not providing the safety that people of Los Angeles need and they're paying for. And this situation continues and it will continue until we get a change in the system. That's the simple solution, the change in the system. That means change the people in political office that care about you, the victim, and your families and want to keep you safe. The bottom line is safety takes time and people, and we don't really have the motivation from a lot of people in politics that want to make that happen. I'm not going to criticize the mayor. She's trying, but clearly there's some council members that don't care. Dennis Zine on the line, live here on 790 KBC, former Los Angeles City Council member, former LAPD sergeant, current reserve officer, 55-plus years with the City of Angels, and we salute you for your service and caring. Dennis Zine, thank you very much for coming to the line this afternoon. Pleasure. Thank you much, Frank. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis Zine, with us on the line here on 790, right out to the freeways now on 790 KBC. Motaka Money continues here in 790 KABC. Good afternoon. The Biden administration recently releasing a proposal that, if finalized, could potentially decimate innovation across most important areas of technology. Keeping an eye on this is David Capos, chairman of the board of the Council for Innovation Promotion. David, thank you very much uh, for taking the call here with us live this afternoon. Yeah, my pleasure, Frank. Take it from the top and tell us uh, what we need to know about this. Yeah, sure. So um, there's a piece of legislation that's been around a long time, passed in 1980, called the Bayh-Dole Act. Um, bipartisan Senators Birch Bayh and Bob Dole. And it revolutionized um, tech transfer in the U.S., enabling universities, like many great universities there in Southern California and small companies, to keep title to the inventions that they made using government funding. And it was a revolution for the U.S., leading to literally trillions of dollars of economic opportunity, many millions of jobs, um, and uh, thousands of products and services that wouldn't otherwise exist. So an unqualified success of a piece of legislation that's worked extraordinarily well for over 40 years. Many, many other countries have copied it when they realized um, how positive it was for uh, economic development. And so suddenly the Biden administration um, is talking about turning that on its head and sending government regulators in to um, march in on uh, innovation made under the Bayh-Dole Act and take it away from small businesses and universities who have um, made these innovations using government funding. Uh, real disaster. It will chill innovation. It will cause universities and startups and other small companies to walk away from the innovations they create using government funding. And um, so it's something I'm hoping the administration will stop and will walk away from uh, and will leave the Bayh-Dole Act, which, as I've said, has been a huge success. Um, it ain't broke. Don't fix it. So essentially, uh, what you're describing, they, they essentially want to nationalize uh, innovations uh, and inventions at the uh, big universities. Yep, that, that's exactly right. We'd have, instead of the market determining prices and instead of the market determining which products succeed and fail, we're going to have government regulators doing that. Under the guise of uh, focusing on, uh, on big pharma, right, uh, the White House um, has been... Uh, Mentioning that part of it, um, basically, uh, this, though, would take control of patents uh, owned by universities um, in virtually all areas of technology, not just in the uh, pharmaceutical area. Well, that's exactly right, Frank. The, the, it, and it's not a bill, actually. It's um, a regulation, so it doesn't even yeah. rise to the level of law. In fact, it's, it's probably illegal because the Bayh-Dole Act itself, which was a law passed by con Congress and signed by the president, did not permit this kind of march in. So it's a regulation that will permit this march in. And indeed, um, it will substitute um, government judgment, if you will, for, uh, for the marketplace. 
And 1980 takes us back to a time when, when there was still some uh, bipartisanship right. Uh, Birch Bayh, the famous uh, Democratic senator, and, and Bob Dole, of course, the former Republican senator who also ran uh, for president. Um, that's, uh, that's what they were able to uh, craft uh, back in those days. Yeah, and, and it's been referred to in retrospect as perhaps the single most important piece of business legislation of the entire 20th century. It's hard to overstate how successful it's been and how many companies it's created, how many life-saving products and services. Like you said, Frank, um, the administration is billing this as about drug prices, but it's not about drug prices. It's about all categories of technology, everything from quantum computing to artificial intelligence to medical products, of course, life sciences are included, material sciences, you know, everything you could imagine. Many great industries from Southern California will be badly affected by this. What do you think is pushing this? Um, they've been described as anti-patent activists or who's uh, who wants to see this happen? Well, I think the administration, you know, and we all want drug prices to be reasonable. So no fault to anyone for wanting that. It's an election year gambit, right? It's aimed at um, uh, telling voters we're doing everything we can to bring drug prices down. And again, no, no, no fault to anyone for wanting drug prices to be under control. But the patent system and the Bayh-Dole Act shouldn't be used as a tool or um, a, an excuse, if you will, um, for, uh, for solving a problem that they're not directed to solving. The patent system has nothing to do with drug prices, and the Bayh-Dole Act especially has nothing to do with drug prices. So basically, uh, if this um, is uh, reversed, it, it would basically destroy uh, investors' incentives to, to license federally funded research and, and, uh, and really kill... Uh, a lot of the innovation we've seen over the last 40 plus years. Right. A tremendous chilling effect. And I'm already hearing it. I'm having people calling and asking, should we take government funding to do research and development anymore? Or will it be polluted? The, the words like contaminated and polluted are being used in association with government funding. First time in my lifetime I've heard that. And it's really quite chilling. David Capos, chairman of the board of the Council for Innovation and Promotion. Do you guys have a website and uh, like to be able to follow uh, what uh, your reports and so forth? Yeah, we do, Frank. And uh, this is a nonprofit. It's called, as you said, Council for Innovation and Promotion. You can go to c4ip.org, and there's a lot of information about um, this gambit to overturn the Bayh-Dole Act, uh, um, and you can read more and learn how to hopefully get involved, talk to your, you know, members of Congress there in Southern California and get them to weigh in, as many already have, to tell the White House. Super. David, thank you very much for joining us live. David Campos, Chairman of the Board of the Council for Innovation Promotion, live with us here on Motec on Money on 790 KBC. Stay tuned now for the 790 KBC News Blitz. Movies, TV shows, books, podcasts, and more. It's what women binge with Melissa Joan Hart and her friend Amanda Lee. We have Lauren Bosworth with us. Yay! Yay! The Hills. So what is like your number one question from fans? The primary question I still get asked was, what, is it real? <laughs> <laughs> In 2024, to me, is a surprising question to get because I feel like everybody has been through the reality TV gauntlet at this point. What women binge wherever you listen.